Shabbos. Good morning, members, and welcome to the first uh, committee after the recess. I hope you're all suitably restored and refreshed and ready, ready to go. Um, it's the Social Work Services Committee. We have uh, a quick welcome to Councillor Lever, who's joining the committee. Um, so nice to see you on board. Um, this meeting will be recorded and subsequently made available for the public um, for listening purposes. So if you just bear that in mind, and if you could put your mobiles on to silent or vibrate, uh, during the meeting as a courtesy, that would be great. Thank you very much. So with that, we'll kick off. No, no. No, sorry. New, new town excitement there. <laughs> uh, so if we can just um, get a quick note uh, of the... Sorry, of the uh, Cedron and apologies, please, Claire. Thank you, Chair. We've got two apologies this morning from Councillor Dickie Campbell and Councillor David Ingalls. Um, Councillor Holly Scobie is not present and since the papers were issued for this meeting, we've, as you said, we've got two additional members for this meeting being Jeff Lever and Andrew Wood. There is currently one vacancy from the non-affiliated group. Thank you. Apologies, Councillor Wood. Uh, if I could thank you for your previous input and also welcome you back to the committee then in that case. Um, thank you. Uh, and with that, do we have any declarations of interest from members? No, thank you. So with that then we'll go on to the minute of the previous meeting, item three. This is for approval. Are we happy to agree the minute? Agreed. Thank you. Uh, and then on to item four. This is um, external residential units report by Chief Social Work Officer. We have with us today um, uh, Catherine Agnew and Alison Jameson, I believe. Um, not oh, who's, who's maybe not arrived yet, but uh, effectively the care inspector are here to give a presentation to us, um, so if I could maybe invite uh, Catherine to the the lectern, um, and if you want to maybe just introduce and go through your presentation, thank you. Okay, don't uh, Good morning, everybody. I'm realising I'm a little bit small. Um, I'm, my name's Catherine Agnew. I'm the Chief Inspector for Children's Services with the Care Inspectorate. My colleague, Alison Jameson, who knows everything about residential childcare in Dumfries and Galloway and is a relationship manager, is not here yet. So I'm hoping that there's, if she doesn't arrive, there's not too many hard questions. So what we thought we would do is just give you a brief overview in relation to the Care Inspectorate's responsibilities in relation to residential childcare. So... Um, the Care Inspectorate was formed, a predecessor body was the Care Commission, and the Care Inspectorate was formed under Public Services Reform Scotland Act 2010, and we're the independent scrutiny body for social care services in Scotland. So for our responsibilities, there are four key responsibilities. We register all care services in Scotland. We then have a duty to inspect. We also investigate complaints about care services. And we also have enforcement powers that we can undertake enforcement powers, but also throughout the legislation, we have a duty to support improvement and provide public assurance. We also have responsibilities in relation to joint inspections of services for social work and for children, but this is about residential childcare. So care homes for children, and young people, and a care home is defined under the legislation as a service which provides accommodation together with personal care and support to persons for reason of their vulnerability or need. And that's my colleague, Alison Jameson. So hard questions are back on the agenda. It's <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> all right. Okay. Uh, in Scotland, there are 311 uh, children, young people care homes. There, the 18 is dubious. As according to our statistician yesterday, there's 19. Uh-huh. Um, care homes in Dumfries and Galloway, so got that. Um, so our scrutiny activity is intelligence-led, and what I mean by that is we have an awful lot of information about care services across Scotland. But for children and young people, services because they are a care home, they are in, they are inspected every year, and the Scottish government call that a statutory inspection. So we have to have a minimum of one inspection per year. 
Um, that inspection methodology has just been reviewed and it's on our website and we're actually, this is our first inspection year using that and that takes account of best practice and in the health and social care standards. So if anybody's interested in that and how we inspect, you'll be able to see a copy of that on our website. We also receive complaints about care services and children and young people care services are one of the lowest percentage of complaints that we receive. So we're doing a piece of work with uh, children and we're doing with uh, other people to see if we can encourage people actually to make sure that we're getting their views. Um, but any complaints that come into Care Inspector are what we call triaged. So there are times that we actually don't get enough information about a care service or about the complaint and it might be anonymous. So we might use that as intelligence or we might have a provider resolution and that is where we've got a highly performing provider and we would ask them to look at that issue in conjunction with the complainant or we may go to a full complaint investigation. We also have enforcement powers. We've got a range of enforcement powers. We can put a condition on a registration certificate. We can issue uh, an improvement notice uh, which says you must make these improvements by X date or we will cancel your registration or we can go for an emergency cancellation to Sheriff. Uh, one emergency cancellation actually took us almost a year to get through the Sheriff by the time they heard the case but the registration had been suspended so although it's an emergency cancellation it's not on that day. But in relation to our enforcement action, we can only look at enforcement action where there's a serious risk to health or well-being of a service user. Um, so what we do through all of our activity is we assess the quality of care and support that a young person is receiving within a residential care service. Uh, mentioned already the health and social care standards. These are just not for the care inspector. These are for everyone that's involved in providing care in Scotland, but we take an account in all our scrutiny work, we take account of the health and social care standards. So what they do is they describe the quality of care that people should experience. Uh, they're across all care services, child care, social care, social work, children's services, community justice. And they're re relevant for not just us, but for planning, assessment, commissioning and the service delivery. So we've been working with Lillian and other people in Dumfries and Galloway and they had highlighted to us some issues about children being placed from out with the authority within care homes. So Alison and the team uh, developed what we call the admissions guidance and it really puts out the care inspectorate's expectations on what we expect. So it's about matching looked after children to the right service. It's about planning and assessing needs before the placement begins and it's aimed to support positive outcomes for children. So when we talk about um, matching uh, young people, this is what we expect services to provide to placing authorities. Inform this is just a small part of it. The document's more extensive than this. So we would like them to know a bit about the ethos, the location of the service, what's going to be provided, what the young person will be able to access, how they would maintain family support and relationships, what education provision the young person would be able to attend, and what specialist services would be available to that child should they be placed in that unit. But then we ask the provider of the care service, when they're considering a referral, that they should consider uh, the place and authority's expectations and the legal basis for that placement, which is crucial. Uh, we also expect that the, before the provider accepts the placement, that they consider a chronology of significant events in that young person's life, whether or not they've been going missing from previous placements, any history of behavioural distress or harmful behaviours, any involvement in offending behaviours, and then specific health needs and arrangements that are needed for that young person's safety, and also the availability of services, resources and equipment needed to support that young person in their placement, and generally the capacity of that care home to meet the young person's individual needs. And all of that, if that should all be assessed, it should be all included in the child's care plan and how of all these needs will be met. 
But some of the things that support us in uh, putting this guidance out to providers are the health and social care standards. Specifically, you can see uh, three that I've picked out. I have enough time and support to plan my move to a new service. I experience high quality care and support because people have the necessary information and resources. And I experience a service as near as possible to people who are important to me and my home area. So the next step, that we're just reviewing the admissions and matching guidance. We've done that with some services and some young people. We are now going to be developing my plan, which is a best practice guidance to support services to develop a child's care plan. And that would take into account the pre-assessment information and we'll continue to review our new inspection framework. So that's a whistle stop to to our responsibilities in relation to registered care services. So if there's... Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll, I guess I'll just throw it open to members for questions. Are there any questions yeah. for the care inspector here today? Lind. It's never been totally clear to me, Chairman, um, the, the level of responsibility that we as elected members have for children who are out with come from out with our region and who are placed in care homes in our region. Um, it, it's never been totally clear to me. What, what's your involvement with that? This is one of the areas that actually is not the responsibility of the care inspectorate. We don't have, we can't say to a provider whether or not they can admit a specific child. Our respons responsibility is to look at how they meet the needs of that child once at the place. So we're trying to make sure they take account of all the child's needs by providing them with guidance on admissions and matching children. Just on that, because we did briefly discuss this earlier, um, but one of the things that we've made a, made the care inspector aware of here is, uh, I suppose, if somebody's getting placed from another local authority area out with of Scotland into uh, the Friesen Galloway, then this is where maybe, although everybody might be aligned in terms of their objectives, in terms of finding the best solution for the child, um, the boundaries between the different bodies sometimes doesn't allow for that to happen easily. So what kind of work are you doing towards trying to get a better solution for that? We have set up a MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding with Ofsted, to try to share a bit of information for children moving between Scotland and England. And obviously England are very keen on children moving also to Wales and Northern Ireland. Um, at this point in time, we can't, we don't know that a child's placed in a care home in Scotland until we inspect that care home because we don't have the ability to ask a provider to give us that information okay. that's out with our responsibility. But the only thing that we were thinking about was maybe placing authorities across borders could have memorandums of understanding about placing children and having some involvement with that placement and the assessment of need. Just to come back in, uh, it's a, so it is a recognised area that could do with improvement and that's your take steps towards that? Yeah, I would certainly be asking the provider who's offering the placement, um, you know, in terms of our admissions guidance, mm -hmm. that I think is actually very clear in terms of them being assured that they could provide the services a young person might need in moving into their service. So we'd certainly be looking at that at inspection. Um, you know, with, with a, for example, if there are specific health needs that need to be addressed for that young person while they're in placement, we would be looking to the provider of having checked out the arrangements that are in place um, so that that child can access them. So we certainly look at, at those issues when we Councillor Maitland, I did kind of uh, trample over you there, but um, are you wanting back in to follow up your question? Thank you. I'm very happy to let other people come in and, and talk. I think there is. I think, I think we maybe need to go back to that and um, think about how we can advance that and, and, and I think probably offer support. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Ian Carruthers. Oh. Grateful for Councillor Maitland for raising the point, but I think it's probably more your point that I'm interested in, uh, interested in both points. But So this council has recently undertaken a piece of work in regards to health and social care and the sharing of information and how we can actually get better at that. Quite often when you have 
real incidents, you could make, or major incidents with child child abuse, so on and so forth, quite often it's related to the lack of sharing of information. And it sounds like you're coming up the same thing. So if Scotland and England almost aren't sharing this information freely, I wonder just, so what is it, if you go into more detail, what is the problem, what is it you're actually doing to try and get over that, that obstacle, and what differences do you think it'll make when you do finally get over it? I mean, what we've done is what is within our powers at this point in time, and that is to provide guidance to the providers before to consider to make sure that a child's health, social care needs, educational needs can be met within that service before the provider accepts a placement. Um, what we also encourage is the provider has to make contact local to make sure those services are available. In relation to an authority sharing a, information about a child coming into another authority, that wouldn't be within our remit. That would be out, out with our ability to act in relation to that. One of the other complicating factors is because we may only inspect once in every 12 month period, children could be in and out of a care service out with that period of time as well. So the inspection only provides an overview of what that service, how that service is operating at that point in time. I just wonder if my question is maybe better aimed at Lillian and, and the local authority in regards to, to their responsibilities. Maybe I'm a wee bit misunderstanding what's being said from the care inspector, its role to the local authorities. And probably to put it into context, uh, probably as a scenario, I'm thinking, say we received a child in the Friesen Gallery from Outwith, say it was England for that, for that matter, if, unless, unless I, I'll, I'll be corrected, but if, if we are acting in the same way as with the care, if the sharing of information is the same way as what it should with the care inspector, then we potentially could have a child coming with some really potential needs, and whether it's in crisis, whatever levels, it could actually be risks and threats towards other children, other communities, so on and so forth. Maybe it will be low level, maybe I'm over-egging it, I don't know, but just the risks that are there, obviously, for both the child and and uh, the new environment that's coming in. I just wonder how, how would we cope for that? So maybe my question is better aimed at yourself, Lillian, as the cane inspector. Uh, thank you, Councillor Crullers. I mean, we do have scenarios where you know, people are placed in the region that present significant challenges that we're not aware of. And we have a much more robust, um, as Councillor Thompson explained, uh, system in place with our colleagues within Scottish local authorities. And there is a mutual agreement that we will all let each other know when we have a young person placed within the region and some of those information sharing um, processes are much more robust. However, the challenge oftentimes is that the responsibility to share directly with ourselves would come from the providers. So if there's a young people that they have accepted into the region, that then starts there, there starts to be some challenges or issues, then it's their responsibility to make sure that the local services are fully aware. Some of the challenges um, around that are that that doesn't all, always happen, and we only tend to become involved when there's a crisis situation. And clearly, Alison is our link from the care inspectorate, then Alison and myself uh, would have that conversation. We have done quite a lot of work locally with our, our uh, partner providers, and some of the systems are more robust now, but at the end of the day, we don't have any authority as to what children are placed within the region. We don't have any authority to demand that information, and whilst it's good practice, and we would always try to do that, we actually don't have any power as a local authority either. The providers, if they accept that child, do not have to advise us, although it's good practice for them to do so. Councillor Wood. Thank you, Chair. What I'm picking up is that we don't actually have a tracking mechanism for youngsters that come into the care system because we have situations whereby they may be put in the placement and then they find that the parent or parents are able to take them back because the, the situation has resolved. Then when they get put back, they find that it breaks down again or the parents move to a different area and they go into a different placement. And there seems to me to be there's no mechanism to follow that child through all the variations that can take place. Would I be right in saying that? I think I think you, you are right in saying that, uh, and I think we're very aware of that. Um, the local authority and the placing authority will have a track for that child, but it's something that we have been talking about as a, as a team more and more, and we are starting to track some children through services 
in Scotland, both children that are from Scotland and from England, because I think you're right in knowing, and particularly I think in this area, you do have a high number of children coming across border into the services that are based here. So it's something we're talking about, we're thinking about, we're, we've made a request for us to review our notification system. Um, we, we track children in fostering adoption through a notification system where if there's a disruption in a foster placement, we need to be notified by the fostering agency. And we're looking at including that um, for, for care homes for young people as well, so that we get a better idea about the, the number of moves that young people have and we will be able to track better. Because our concern is moves are disruptive for children. It's not in their interest. It doesn't help them settle. It doesn't help them address the issues that they've had from early trauma and move forward. Um, and it might be an indication to us that some services are not matching appropriately in the first place if children are not being able to be uh, cared for in that setting. So that's something we're looking to Our strategic to inspection also looks at a sample of children and case tracks children within an authority, but we only do up to six of those a year. But then the other concern is that it does take away the continuity of the learning experience of those youngsters when they are getting chopped and changed continually from pillar to post. And it would be good to try and find a mechanism whereby you can put into place some form of continuity because at the end of the day a lot of these youngsters when they do become adults they've missed out on a good education and therefore they, they struggle you know to take things forward yep wouldn't disagree with that and as Alison said there is work ongoing to try to improve how we track but at this point in time when we look at the individual care service what we have is some limited information because children could have been placed and then moved on elsewhere. Uh -huh. and, and that will be intelligence for us. We can't insist that a young person remains in a placement and we can't insist that a provider holds on to that placement mm -hmm. if it transpires that it's not meeting the needs of that young mm -hmm. person or indeed the other young people that are already settled in that placement. So for us it would be looking again and reminding providers about the, the need to have good quality information about young people prior to them being admitted to the service. And some providers are telling us that they don't always get that from placing authorities. And it's often after the young person is placed that they start to find out that there are issues and, and, and situations that have occurred in earlier uh, years that they haven't been made aware of. And so it's very yeah. difficult to... Mm -hmm. To monitor and that's that. why we're trying to make sure that they insist on getting the right information before they accept the placement. To make a state that. Just one final one, and that is, how do you actually evaluate your success? Success in, in working with providers. We um, we we have an improvement agenda. I mean, we're, we're very clear that part of our remit is about improvement of services. So we work very closely, both ourselves and our improvement team uh, that we have established within the care inspectorate that will help providers look at how they make improvements and sustain that. It's a kind of theory around improvement and how to do that. And it, it would be in the grading. Mm -hmm. It would be, um, if we're doing a bit of work with a provider around a particular issue, we would go back in following that work. We don't manage that work, but we'll, we will signpost and we will give advice and then we'll go back and inspect and look at whatever area that is we've been uh, helping them with in terms of improvement and grading against that. So I suppose our success is, um, it's quite difficult to measure our success because the, success is, a, the <laughs> success is actually how the provider takes that forward. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and now I've got uh, Councillor Little. Thank you, Chair. Uh, first, thank you for that whistle top. Whistle stop tour of the system um, is an item that I was particularly really keen for today. It gives um, like good clarity on the Inspectorate sort of system. What I'd like to ask is um, the Inspectorate assessors and even those considering referrals, have they came up through, I'm, I'm interested in the journey. Now I'm not um, questioning the training or how experienced they'll be in other ways, but have they come up through the system themselves, like worked within the service 
um, in a different capacity, like ground level knowledge. Uh, we've just recently um, completed a recruitment drive and our person spec and our job, job profile asked for experience in the relevant area that an inspector will be working in. So we look for people who have had leadership or management experience in a care setting, but also relevant like children and young people's uh, experience through their career. Once we do um, employ somebody, we do have a professional development award that people have to work towards to gain as part of the registration with the SSC as well to further enhance their knowledge of scrutiny. So you, you will have also, I mean, that, that's great, thank you for that, but do you still have people who come up right from the ground level that have been working with within the service right with the children coming up to that level? Yes, that, sorry, that's yeah, what I was meaning, yeah. yes. We come, take people from a variety, so of course... There's a number of services we regulate mm -hmm. under children and young people. So it may well be a, somebody with strong fostering and adoption. It may have been somebody who's worked with children and families. Usually what you find by the time people come to work with this care inspectorate, they've had a range of experiences working with children in different uh, roles and responsibilities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Dempster. Hey, thank you. I'm interested maybe in your authority or your power when somebody applies to have a property registered for the first time. And the case that I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of was a local provider here bringing children with, with the region. But they bought a remote farm at the top of a valley, five miles to the nearest settlement, the most inappropriate place to take young children that need support, a interaction with others. What happened was these kids eventually had the chaotic situations and disrupted the local community and it was really, really inappropriate and uh, I don't think it's there, in fact I'm certain it's not there now but this guy, and what, what happened was instead of being a, a benefit to these children, I believe it created extra pressure on them it made life difficult for them and it impacted on the, the local community as a consequence of that and I would have thought that if you take these members here and show them it, they'd say, oh, it's the wrong place. And I would have thought the care inspector might have had the power or authority to say that as well, that in some circumstances, the chosen location just isn't the right. I can't imagine young people wanting to stay in an environment like that. For my sins, I also have uh, the National Registration Team under my remit for uh, registering care services. And we have a... We register care services and we look at a number of criteria we look at the aims and objectives of the new service. We look at staffing, leadership, management, fitness of manager, policies and procedures. And we look at that and we evaluate that. And we will give advice. But if a service will say to us, this is the, this is the need in the children that we're going to be caring for, this is how we're going to meet them, this is how they're going to have access to the community. And we have to take into account the regulator's code. And from that point of view, we have to then register that service if it's fit. And unfortunately, sometimes, once the service is operational, it doesn't operate in the way that it's been planned to do. And that's where we have to get to the point that we have to undertake relevant scrutiny work with that provider. And sometimes that does mean imposing conditions or cancelling a service. Thanks for that. Maybe that's what happened because it certainly yeah. wasn't appropriate. And, um, Thank you. Um, Councillor Maitland again. Um, could, could we go back to the complaints issue that um, you were suggesting that there were not really, you thought perhaps there were rather a low level of complaints. I mean, you know, the, the social work services receives complaints about its service in terms of locally. Um, but I'm curious about why that does not get escalated up to you. Um, and you know, do you filter out? Do you do you triage complaints that come to you and say, no, these aren't for us? Some complaints that come to us aren't for us because it's about the quality of the care provided to the young person. Um, and therefore, it wouldn't be for us. But if a complaint does come to us, we would respond to it and we would give the reasons why. But we don't get an awful lot of complaints about the quality of care provided for children and young people. We also don't get a lot of complaints that come about care services that aren't for us in relation to children and young people. And I, I think part of, we've been trying to do some work with young people in relation to that, 
um, and our complaints team are looking at how we can encourage and empower young people to make complaints because we're sure they have them. They're sure they're, we're sure they're not always satisfied with uh, the level of care that they're getting. But I think it's something about young people feeling disenfranchised, <coughs> feeling they don't have the, that they don't have the, the, the knowledge sometimes to make a complaint. So we do an inspection, uh, tell them how to do it. And the, the other thing is, I'm just comparing this to care homes for older people, where you have relatives visiting a care home who are seeing mm -hmm. the care that their, their loved one is ex experiencing. You don't have that as much in uh, care homes for young people. So it's certainly an area of work that we, we, we do try to um, you know, inform young people of their rights around that. It sounds as if we should start to complain, actually. Arguably, I think maybe that, um, that if things are going wrong, and I'm particularly thinking about the issue that um, Councillor Carruthers was talking about, the sharing of information um, and the, the obligation that you have. You have it says that you have to make contact um, and you have to, you really are supposed to tell the receiving uh, authority that there are children coming into your area. Um, um, what I really would say is, is, what do you do when you discover that, that there is a policy issue here that needs to be changed? What's, what, what, what do you do about a gap like this? I mean, we could complain to you that we are not receiving um, information from um, uh, English uh, providers, English-based providers, we could complain to you, and you would say, well, what can we do about it? There is no, so, but, but arguably, we could complain to you and say, well, you ought to be doing something about it. What are you saying to your political masters? We, we couldn't take any action against any English authority. If a care provider was taking children inappropriately, and we felt they weren't making the right contacts with the local authority to say this child's coming in and it'll have to, these are the health care needs, these will need support, so you know, then we can, as Alison said earlier, evaluate the quality of leadership and management to reflect that. So that's what we, that's, that's what's within our powers. We can advise uh, providers to share information with authorities, but we can't insist on that, but we can take action if it's then we deem that to be inappropriate and not good leadership and management of an individual care service. The, the Just a couple of uh, questions. Are the inspections unannounced or are they done on a regular basis? Because obviously it's a bit like school inspections, you know, the, uh, the, the staff can work very hard to make sure everything's perfect when uh, uh, the inspection takes place and from what you were saying about the um, in some instances the lack of transfer or clarity of transfer of information regarding the needs of a particular uh, individual uh, young person to the uh, the provider isn't there a temptation for the local authority to try and shift problems from their particular region into the uh, the host region as uh, councillor Dempster was saying it would be inappropriate for us to think that an, an authority would move a child inappropriately um, in relation to our inspections, all our inspection complaints activity are unannounced unless there's an exception and a reason for that. Um, we may go in and first day be unannounced and then come back at a later date because we want to meet ex members of staff who weren't on duty that day. Mm -hmm. So everything within that is done in an unannounced basis and that was done following public consultation a number of years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I grant it would be inappropriate for that to happen, but have we got any evidence that it has happened? We don't have that kind of evidence at this point in time. Councillor Little, you want to back? Thank you, Chair. It's kind of an extension on Councillor Maitland's point about complaints, and I'm thinking, your care homes for children and young people, who would complain? Um, I mean, I'm a 10-year-old child and I'm, I'm in a care home and I don't really have anyone out with that and I'm not feeling I'm being um, treated sufficiently. Is there a mechanism? I mean, who would I complain to? If there's not many complaints about, about, what's, about the care, who can complain? If, if, I'm not sure if there would be anywhere to complain about the people that were caring for me within the people that are caring for me. How does that work? So when young people are admitted, we would expect them to be informed of their right to complain to us, because they, 
all servitudes need to, to be told that. Um, but yes, even though they have that information, it's difficult for their 10-year-old to, to complain. Um, we look to make sure that services have good advocacy arrangements. So who cares, for instance, have a, a, a part to play in terms of supporting young people who are, are in residential care. So, and we have had complaints through, uh, through cares in the past or from young people who, who cares have supported to make them to us. But we also, um, we have staff, sometimes will make complaints about the care. Staff working in care services do come forward and make usually anonymous complaints mm -hmm. to us. That's some of the difficulty because it's difficult to get back to somebody to, to actually have a conversation about what the issue is. So if they're making an, anon an anonymous complaint through our website, for instance, it's, and we don't have sufficient information to understand what it is. That's a real difficulty for us. But staff do sometimes. Mm -hmm. And social workers. Social workers have sometimes make mm -hmm. complaints uh, about services too. One of the other things that we try to do through our inspection is we always make sure our inspection involves speaking mm -hmm. to young people. But we also have got questionnaires that we ask young people to complete. And we're trying to develop to match the new inspection framework some more high-tech, kind of Facebooky yeah. type ways that people, young people can uh, comment on the quality of care that they're receiving through, through their mobile, mobile device, etc. In some of our inspections, we also use young inspection volunteers mm -hmm. who are care-experienced young people who have left care but understand what care is about. And uh, I, I think they have a really crucial role in engaging mm -hmm. with young people during the inspection process, and they often um, are able to highlight issues in the inspection for us too. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to add, um, and I'm just touching on Alison's point about obviously every young person who has been accommodated, whether they're uh, north or south of the border, has a social worker. Um, now, obviously, from our own point of view, our own children that are placed out with region, we have regular contact and review. I can't say that that happens in our 19 establishments within Dumfries and Galloway that are external provision. Um, but it, obviously, if the social workers down south get that complaint, they should have a mechanism. They know the mechanism to either refer it to ourselves or indeed directly to the care inspectorate. O obviously, some of these young people are also within the school setting within Dumfries and Galloway. So we would hope that there's an opportunity there to raise concerns if they feel comfortable enough to do that. And also some of the young people, particularly those older young people, um, are part of our corporate parenting process in terms of the board and the Listen to Us advocacy service who have the outreach responsibility within Dumfries and Galloway. I wouldn't say to you that that always happens, but I think there are opportunities and it's how we best use those and grow them to, to allow that and assist young people to make those complaints if they feel their level of care is not appropriate. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Murray. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, you, the Care Commission will be accountable to Scottish ministers, presumably. I just wondered um, what sort of information you require to provide in terms of that accountability and what are the opportunities then, if there are uh, issues, say, with lack of seamlessness and information being passed on and so on, you know, what opportunity do you get to pass that back, uh, you know, to possibly suggest that regulation needs to be changed or whatever? In relation to our scrutiny activity, every year we have to agree a scrutiny plan with Scottish ministers. We approve that. That's out with our statutory inspections. The rest of our scrutiny activity is agreed with them. Uh, when there are instances in relation to specific care services that are high profile, etc., we do regular briefings to Scottish uh, ministers and through our sponsorship branch. We also have probably quarterly meetings with sponsorship branch that talk about key areas of interest or concern, etc., to share that information. And the issue about children being placed in Scotland from other countries is an area that is highlighted and people are aware of it. I appreciate that's not, it's not necessarily terribly easy to sort all of that just from within Scotland, because it's about the sort of agreements with the organisations in other countries, but you do get the opportunity to, to flag up that some of these things aren't working properly. Uh, good question. It sort of brings me to what action we can competently take. 
Um, so, I mean, it would be, I take it you're effectively, if we were to write to your regulators, that would be the most appropriate way to raise a concern on behalf of how things were managed so that the best outcome for children was being achieved with all the different agencies involved, because whoever regulates you would be the one to carry that forward at the national levels, for example. Or, I mean, are you able to sort of signpost this on that one? In relation to our roles and responsibilities, that's in relation to the individual care services. We also have some responsibilities for local authorities through a strategic inspection. We don't have any powers over English authorities, and we don't have powers on who providers accept into their care homes. What we can do, if they do that inappropriately, is take action and evaluate the service accordingly, and if we're required to take enforcement action. Mm -hmm. Members, what do we want to do with this? Councillor Maitland. I think in conjunction with the Chief Social Work Officer is to think about what are the issues for us here um, and, and to really note it and make certain that it is actually recorded about what we consider the problems to be particularly with respect to sharing of information and the cross-border issues and how this is then escalated. Because, I mean, at the end of the day, we're all just trying to... It's not a question of what does each department or each um, um, agency deal with. It's what happens to each child. And, and, and that's where, obviously, we're, we're, all, we're all working towards. Um, but if there are barriers, then we need to flag them up, make them absolutely clear so that and, and start to shout. And because exactly the same thing, I mean, Councillor Leavis in charge of the education department side of things, and, and he will know that there are problems that bubble up through that and then, then through communities. You know, so, so it's, it's everybody's job, actually. Councillor Carruthers. Councillor Leaver picked up on a point I was going to come in on, and that is the ad hoc arrangement potentially for doing an inspection. Listen to the whole subject matter and how, how the theme and how it's come through. It reminds me very much of uh, the Council's relationship with Audit Scotland. So Audit Scotland comes in usually pre-arranged, uh, and at the end of that, with the, the going through an improvement act, usually find fault, usually one way or another, or, or they're, they're reasonably happy. It's very similar audit the, the, that, that the relationship. But I think in in, in uh, promptude visits, ad hoc, uh, just turning up on the day without notice, I think that's a good way of actually keeping people on their toes. You're aware. And if you're saying actually you've, you've went through a public consultation, that's not, you don't feel that's appropriate or the outcome of that consultation, you've got a different methodology. I haven't got major concerns about it. I think it's de better, as, as Council Leavers have already alluded to. Can ad hoc visits is, is quite a good way of keeping people conscious and aware of the responsibilities, a, high, a higher level of service. And I think it is a good way. And that's maybe a point I think as, as a local authority, I think we should certainly accept and, and promote, really. We shouldn't be dictators over it, but certainly it, it, it's a good approach, I think. Yeah, so I think there's a, <coughs> there's a number of things that need to be condensed into something coherent. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry, thank you. Sorry, no, we do all of our scrutiny work and announced in relation to individual care services. We have no intention of changing that. Sorry, I just thought, no, no, we have no intention of changing that. It came through loud and clear a few years ago when we did public consultation that people wanted us to do our work on an unannounced basis, and we have no intention of changing that. Apologies, Chair, I picked that up as being the other way around. Okay, no, I think that is best practice. Okay, well, we have, I mean, we have, this committee has a delegation to lead corporate parenting in respect to children in care. So, I think uh, on the back of Councillor Maitland's suggestion that uh, effectively um, the Chief Social Worker Officer has been taking a note of the concerns that have been raised. If there's a way that we can maybe draft something and maybe share with Social Work Committee members um, in terms of like um, a letter to highlight what our concern is in terms of putting the child at the centre of things, obviously taking the input from the Inspector, which has been in extremely useful today, I think, and thank you for, for the presentation and answers to the questions, but um, it's clearly maybe out with what you're able to do in terms of what we're hoping to achieve, which would be for the child to be at the centre of all the agencies, um, quite simply. And uh, if we can maybe find a form of words and then maybe circulate that around, is that, are we happy to agree to go forward on that basis? Lillian, if you want to add something. Uh, members, I will, uh, if, you, if uh, members would wish, I will uh, try and draft a report that captures 
not only today's conversation and, and linked to the care inspectorate's presentation, but also some of the mitigating circumstances that we face and also what we're trying to do as a partnership to address those and highlight the areas that are probably out with our gift, but then members are fully aware of the challenges, if that would be helpful. We're happy to agree to that then. Okay, thank you very much and thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Okay, if we then move on to item five, which is the clinical and care governance update, um, we have Julie White here to speak to this report. I'll just allow some uh, musical chairs to happen there, without music, of course. So this is our um, three times a year, a regular update to this committee um, from the clinical and care governance committee of the IJB. Um, Julie, are you settled in and ready to go? Sorry, if you could, if you just put your microphone on. Sorry. <laughs> um, thanks again for the opportunity to come along and speak to Social Work Services Committee about the Clinical and Care Governance um, Committee update of the IGB. Um, I'm not going to go through the, the report in, in any detail. I'm happy to answer any questions. I just really wanted to highlight a couple of things. Um, the report highlights that there is a, a seminar has been organised for the 18th of September. Um, this year, this is as a result, um, colleagues will remember that um, we have been for some time working on the kind of route map, the roadmap for the governance arrangements around the IJB. Um, that work has now been completed and um, through discussion with the leader and deputy leader of the council, chair vice chair of the health board and chair vice chair of the IJB, we decided to hold a seminar for all of elected members as well as members of the health board and the IJB to look at the governance arrangements for the IGB. Um, at that seminar, we will also be talking about the arrangements for the development of the new strategic plan for the IGB. So our existing strategic plan is coming to the end of what's called its period of relevance. And, and we're in, now in the process of starting the development of our new plan for the IGB. So we'll be talking about that at the seminar. And we'll also be picking up on our sustainability and modernisation programme which is our efficiency programme within the Health and Social Care Partnership. So I just really wanted to highlight that to members and also just wanted to highlight in relation to one of the papers that, that was discussed at Clinical and Care Governance um, Committee. I had mentioned um, at the last committee about the work that we've doing in the Health and Social Care Partnership around volunteering. Um, and I talked about the immense success that we'd had around volunteering within the new hospital. I can report that we've now recruited um, 14 volunteers in our rural communities to work within our cottage hospitals and within our cancer drop-in centres um, within in, at our last round of recruitment of volunteers as well as volunteers were working within Mid Park Hospital, primarily supporting people with dementia. At the moment, we've got 195 volunteers working across um, Dumfries and Galloway, Royal Infirmary and the rural communities. And at the time of writing of the report, there's a further 50 applications that are in progress. So um, we're really pleased with the, the number of volunteers we've got working across, not just acute services now, but also across um, the region within um, Dumfries and Galloway. So I just really wanted to highlight that, as I'd mentioned at the last meeting, but I'm happy to answer questions on any of the papers that went to Clinical and Care Governance Committee. Thanks very much, Julie, and that's really encouraging about the volunteer numbers. That's quite uh, quite significant. Um, many members got any questions? Councillor Wood. On page 14, it's 3.5.3. It's to do with the patient service report, complaints and feedback. I note that the NHS continues to face challenges in meeting compliance with complaint timescales. What is being done to address that and what timescale would you hope to be in a position to get caught up with the the backlog, and then also on 3.5.6, and that's the day services review. Further work is required to find a solution to day centre funding. Where are we with that, and how do you hope to address that particular issue? Thanks, Councillor Wood. Um, so in terms of the complaints paper that came, that, that's in relation to the, as you rightly said, the NHS complaints. So we're, they're averaging around sort of 65 to 75 per month. Um, most of those, the, the kind of key themes are around clinical treatment, um, staff attitude and behaviour, staff communication and waiting times at the moment. So um, our timescales for response are um, overall for um, 
when we combine stage one complaints and stage two complaints, it's around 25 days. Um, we, our target is 20 days. So we have just recently, um, we've been working to recruit um, additional capacity within the complaints team. Um, unfortunately, you know, a number of the complaints are extremely complex and involve a range of departments within the health service. Um, so we've been looking at our process for complaints and looking at how we can um, how we can reduce the time scale. Um, the health board have been very clear that they have a they've got a very clear expectation that we deliver on that twenty day time scale as soon as possible, and, and we're reporting back on a, a um, bi monthly basis to the health board and um, to the healthcare governance committee. So we're, we're monitoring it on a monthly basis with the ambition to get back to. Um, delivering within the 20 days um, as quickly as possible. And in terms of the day services review, um, the work is still ongoing. The time frame around that is that the report, um, the IJB have requested that the report comes back in the autumn to the IJB. So that's likely to, it is likely, it's not going to be the September meeting, it's likely to be the November meeting of the IJB. So the expectation is that at that stage, the work, will, the work has been done, undertaken with the day centre network looking at how the funding is currently allocated and looking at a variety of options as to how that funding could be allocated in future. And the proposals that come out from the day centres network will be reported back to the IGB before the end of this year. To add to that, um, I mean, as you've seen, 3.5.6, uh, there'll be a report brought back here for consultation uh, before it goes to the IGB. So I think we'll, we will see the range of options. Um, Absolutely, Chair. To... We've given that commitment each time that we've, we've talked about this day services review here at Social Work Services Committee that the report will come back here and at the stage of consultation we'll go to Council for full Council for consultation in order that elected members can give their views um, to the as part of that consultation process to the IJB before the IJB makes its final commissioning decision. Sorry. What I would like to get a better understanding of, though, and that is what is the objective of the process? Is it to improve the service or is it to close the gap in the funding? I mean, I think ultimately it's about us making sure that we absolutely, it's about us ensuring that we improve, that we're very clear about um, what that service should look like and the quality of that service and then importantly the outcomes for the people that use the service. But it's also about us recognising that we have got a limited pot of resources and that we've got to ensure that it's fair and it's equitably distributed. So um, there's a number of options that are being looked at at the moment by the commissioning team, but with the day centres network, um, as I say, the output of that discussion has yet to be concluded and it's yet to be reported back. But once it is, then absolutely Social Work Services Committee and Full Council will be consulted on that for you to give your views before the IGB makes its decision. Thank you, Councillor Dempster. Uh, thanks, Chair. Two questions or observations. 355 and 356 on page 15. First is about oral health in children, and I take it that's a success story because I don't think uh, uh, there are issues uh, now that there were when I was a, a youngster. But the last line says, Finally, the paper presents information on dental registration participation in the recent Galloway. I presume that's across all age groups. And uh, up in my neck of the woods, although this will apply region wide, it's no a, a, it's no award issue. But there wasn't a, a dentist for a while, and as a compliment, we've now got two. But the registration currently is closed. I think they're dealing with a backlog. So my question is, when situations like that it, exist, do we try and ensure that the least a financially sound people or people on benefits get first access to these types of services because if you don't you find that they need to make a choice between traveling paying travel to go somewhere for a dentist or no going to the dentist where others are financially able maybe to find their own way to another local dentist so i'd be interested to know whether there's some provision made to try and guarantee access to them that most need it that's the first question Second one is, it's about day centres again. And Julie knows I'm really disappointed that Kirkconnell and Killahome, the day centre has been closed. But there's clearly a process now within this paper looking at day care. And again, it's the fifth ISSIMD in Scotland. I would hope that they would still be included in that process 
given that there's funding available and some of it would have been designated for that service the last financial year. And we'll come back to committee, but it's important that that particular community group is in a disadvantage simply because the daycare centre itself was closed maybe six months, a year ago. Okay, so in terms of the um, access to dental services, there isn't a there isn't a prior obviously access to NHS dental services. It's a universal access, so there isn't a prioritisation process. People aren't assessed basically on their financial ability or um, to access the service. However, if there was a challenge for individuals in accessing um, a local service and they contacted the primary care department at the health board, then they would support individuals to access their nearest dental service. So. What we do when there is a, a list closed, for example, and sometimes that's because if a dentist leaves, we're waiting to recruit another dentist so we can't take on new patients, for example, then we would help to facilitate those patients registering with another practice in their nearest to their home and nearest and that best meets their circumstances. For some people, they'll register with somewhere that's near to their place of work rather than nearer to their home. So we'll look at individual needs, but we don't have a prioritisation process per se um, for it because it's a universal process. In terms of the issues um, about the specific issues in um, Kirkconnell and Kellehome, um, Councillor Dempster, I don't have a, I, I can't answer that. I've picked that up. I'll ask Linda Owen as the Commissioner who's leading this work to pick up that specific issue for you and come back to you on that. Um, I, I can't comment on how that, that group has input to the, the next, um, the more strategic piece of work around what the future of daycare looks like, but I'll pick that up and come back to you. Thanks, Julie. Thank you. Um, Councillor Murray first and then Councillor Howie. Thanks. It's about um, 3.5.3 and the challenges uh, in meeting compliance and, and complaints timescales. Uh, the council has exactly the same challenge. Uh, and I wonder whether, do we know whether other health boards across Scotland have got this? I don't, I don't know whether other councils have the same challenge, but do, do other health boards have the same challenge? And given the financial restrictions in both the NHS and local authorities. Is this not a conversation we should be having with the Scottish Public Services Ombudsman is that their time skills are actually uh, not appropriate or, or, very, or very difficult to achieve? I, I think it is something that our, our complaints, we do we, we do sort of benchmark with, with other boards and, and there are there's variances in terms of compliance rates elsewhere. I mean, I think from our perspective, we feel that we absolutely should, um, wherever possible, address complaints at stage one, so at the kind of more informal stage within a five-day period, and we absolutely aim to do that wherever possible, Councillor Murray. Um, at the moment, our, um, when this report was written, our sort of average um, for stage one complaints was around seven days, so we've got a wee bit of work to do around that, but I think it's really important that and certainly my view is that 20 days for a stage two complaint, whilst I'm saying a lot of the complaints are complex, we need to remember that these are individuals who have taken the time to complain because they feel that something has gone wrong with either their clinical treatment, the way in which they were, you know, that the staff attitude behaviours, etc. And that, you know, we certainly encourage our teams to do whatever they can to respond within that time frame, that we don't like to leave people waiting longer than 20 days to get a response to their complaints. So we're certainly doing everything that we can with our looking at the capacity within the patient services team, um, but also um, looking, as I say, at the process, because quite often it involves more than just one team within the health service um, to try and really reduce that time frame. I, I would be probably... Um, whilst it's challenging to meet the 20-day time frame, I think it's important from a patient experience point of view that people aren't left waiting much longer than that to get the response to a complaint. I think more that, that sorry, I mean, I think in the council it's a stage two uh, process that's difficult as well, that a complainant might prefer to have an interim response at stage two within the 20 days, saying actually there's more that needs to be investigated and maybe feel that they're complaint has been brushed aside because they haven't got time to look after it, but like, look into it properly. Absolutely, Councillor Murray. And one of the things that we often say to the teams is that um, it's really important that we we speak to the people making the complaints and we keep in touch with them and advise them. So if there is a delay for whatever reason, um, 
but they're aware of that, that people absolutely get the assurance that we're taking their complaint very seriously and we're taking the time it, take, it needs to, to investigate the complaint. But I think you're absolutely right. The more that we can um, address with complainants at an early stage, and, and often um, complaints can be resolved at an early stage through a, a phone call with individuals, um, you know, it is, it is really important, as you say, that we take the time to do it properly. But I think 20 days should give us sufficient time in most cases um, to be able to undertake a thorough investigation, but make sure we keep the complainant informed at all stages. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Howie. Uh, hi, Julie. It's a, a management issue. As you're aware, uh, the stewardry locality manager is currently uh, covering both the stewardry and Wigginshire. When do you envisage the Wigginshire role will be uh, filled another individual and the security manager return to her position. Um, Councillor Howie, that's something that at the moment um, the the deputy, my deputy um, is currently looking at the, the management arrangements um, to make sure that we have got sufficient cover. So whilst the locality manager within the stewardry is covering both localities in Stewartry and Wigtonshire. We've made sure that she has got support within her team to enable her to continue to provide sufficient cover within the Stewartry area as well. Um, the the time frame is probably going to be another few months at the at the earliest because what we're looking at is the overall management structure within the Health and Social Care Partnership. So there may be wider changes to that structure which will affect individuals. So it's likely to be at least another sort of three to six months before any kind of final decisions made on that. Okay, thank you. Um, I've no further questions that I can see. So um, with with that, uh, are we happy to note the recommendations at 2.1 and 2.2, uh, the, the information provided um, about the Clinical Care Governance Committee held on 2nd of May and also about the upcoming seminar um, on the 18th of September, which would be of great benefit for members to attend. So um, are we happy to note that? Okay, thank you. Thanks, Julie. Um, so on to item six then, which is the annual report, external scrutiny of regulated social work services. Obviously, we will have seen all of these individually uh, in the last year, but this is a summary of the, the sort of the annual summary, if you like, of all the, the reports to date. So um, we're being asked to note this, but we've got Heather here who's happy to speak to this. Uh, I don't know if you want to add a few words before we open it up to questions. Uh, no, I'm happy to take questions. This is information, as you've said, that people have seen over the last year as we've done the quarterly reports. So, any members, any questions? Uh, Councillor McClelland. Thank you, Chair. The point 311, there's an expectation there that uh, the grade, uh, we'd expect the grade to improve at the next in inspection, um, aligned with 37, where nine grades have dropped. Um, I think it would have been helpful if the care inspector had maybe stayed on and agenda item six had been agenda item five and I think we could have had a, a discussion and maybe had uh, their viewpoint uh, uh, but what gives us the confidence that we will see this expectation and these um, grades actually move up because when we've, we've seen some of the items here where we're talking about management and leadership and the impact and the potential impact that could have on the the, those people that we're actually caring for, whether it's adults or children. So um, this doesn't tell us, we don't see in the report what the gap is, so it might have been helpful to have that information uh, from the care inspectorate, uh, their view. But really, where do we get the confidence that we are going to see these grades improved? Okay, I think what we've tried to do in the quarterly reports is give you um, a progress update in terms of the recommendations from the care inspectorate in relation to each of these services. Um, which we would hope would be giving you some assurance in terms of, of things, how things are improving. And I suppose that's where we would look to for that confidence. So it's about um, what, what the service is doing in relation to the recommendations we've been given and the progress that we're making towards them. You know, we know from not necessarily this one, but we know from some of the other ones, um, Dumier Park, for example, we've already had further input from the care inspectorate around the grades. Um, and we know that they are most likely to improved because they have been able to um, assure us in a sense that the progress we're making is sufficient 
and appropriate. The difficulty is that in between the inspections, it's quite difficult for us to, to put that down in black and white because something might happen between now and the next inspection which might sort of set something off track, as it were. But at the minute, um, things are on track and we would expect then to be seeing that. And that's what we would ask our managers to work towards is that where a grade drops, we want to be really clear about why it's dropped. And I think for most of these services, there have been really clear issues that we've identified previously as to why there have been a, um, an issue, for example, the management and leadership where there's been a change um, and where we've had to put stuff in and we've had to support services more. So we would be working towards um, being able to say, actually, this has, this is not what we would expect. And we would be looking to absolutely maintain the grade, certainly at three and above, um, for the fostering and adoption ones particularly. They had always sat at a four or a five. Um, and so we'd be wanting to be sitting back in that range, really, and keeping within that range so that we're not as far off it as we were. So that's the work with our managers at the minute about saying, you yeah. know, they are looking at the progress they're making in relation to the recommendations that have been made. And we would hope that would be give us enough confidence, uh, barring anything else happening in the meantime, because, you know, some of those things we can't, we can't predict at all. But um, in terms of where we're at at the minute, we're fairly hopeful that these things will improve and, and we would see. I say the difficulty is the space between what you get reported here and the next inspection. You know, that can be that can be a year and more um, before we're able to come back and actually say, well, we've done a lot in between and that's already making a difference. But actually formally we can't confirm that to you until actually the, the care inspector have been back, done their inspection and changed the grades. Could I just add that um, follow every inspection whether it be announced or unannounced we always have a very clear action plan to ensure that we have a pathway for improvement so whilst we have continuous improvement within the service um, and we do lots of monitoring on that improvement for every single action that's in included in this report we have an action plan uh, to oversee and as Heather quite rightly says we're confident we're on the right track something may happen particularly around the leadership element but um, I think that we'd be absolutely clear that we have a plan in place to address those. Just coming back quickly, I was uh, I was hoping you you would say there would be some form of review and monitoring because that's the the the, the standard uh, tact that you would take. Um, how often do you actually carry out the review and monitoring with the management team to ensure that the progress is being made? We would expect the action plan that, that Lillian refers to is the action plan we would agree with the care inspectorate. So we know then that between the period of, of that plan being agreed and our anticipated next inspection, it's important to maintain that progress. So we expect our managers to do that monitoring and review as they go. And I would expect that to be sort of very regular with their teams, um, at least on a monthly basis, to be able to say, actually, you know, this is where we've got on this bit. What's happening next? Are there any exceptions that need to be reported up and escalated so that if there were things that were, were happening that actually they weren't able to sort, we would expect that then to be escalated through the management team so that we would be made aware and we could then look at what support we might need to put in. But our experience would be that, that managers have a really good hold of these things. These are Care inspector and action plans are really important because the one thing you don't want to happen is the care inspector to come back on the next inspection for them to look at your previous actions to say, well, actually, you haven't made enough progress on that um, and we know that where that happens we end up with maybe the same recommendation again and and that's not a good position to be in or we, we go with something we end up with something that perhaps is, is is more difficult for us to do so it's in our interest and it's really important in terms of the improvement within the service so we keep a really close handle and that is about monitoring and review thank you and um, first uh, councillor wood thank you chair just following on from that, in 3.12, you're talking about the Muir Park, and it's dropped by two points, and, and that's the management and leadership. And it's all because of a specific crisis. Now, clearly, I understand you can't go into the detail because that's operational. But what I fail to understand is if there's a such close, tight monitoring taking place, how was it not foreseen this specific crisis was going to happen? I think that's part of the, the difficulty with this one, which is why we ended up with the two grades down. There were there were issues around the staff and the management and leadership that actually meant that we weren't as aware as we would have wanted to have been of some of those issues until it hit crisis point. 
Um, and I suppose the assurance I can give you is that the work that we've put in around trying to move that on has been really substantial. Um, in terms of we've made real changes to the management overall. So this is a delegated service to the partnership. Um, and we've shifted the operational management into the partnership. So the management now sits within the mental health directorate. And I would have to say that I can't speak highly enough of the impact that that has had. That's been really helpful, really supportive, and I think has, has really helped us through this crisis and has given us a really good, I think, a firm foundation for moving forward. But it was one of those things where you think that you've got a, your sights on it and you think it's okay. And it's only sometimes when something then goes wrong that when you start to unpick it and you see actually, well, that maybe wasn't as clear or we weren't getting the messages out as clearly as we would have expected to. And therefore we ended up with, with this was a really significant, serious crisis that we dealt with. And I'm pleased to say that, that we're on our way out of that. And the care inspectors themselves are, are, are very pleased and supportive in terms of what we're doing and how we're doing, which is where I'm fairly confident that at the next inspection, we will see a shift in, in the grades here because we've already had some of those indications. Yeah, I think we'll look with interest for the next report on that particular uh, facility. Um, Councillor Maitland. Um, thank you, Chairman. I think actually most of my question has been asked. It's, it's really about recognising the process of going into crisis, exactly, I think, really, what uh, Councillor Wood was saying, that, that you know, it's, it's sort of worrying that the systems we have do not flag that up until we've got to that point. Um, but if you're saying actually there's been such a change now in terms of management, then perhaps we're, we're beyond that, because it, that's the one that stands out as being being a bit of a horror. Um, although uh, we, we really must look at the management leadership. It's, it's all, I mean, a lot, a lot of threes um, as opposed to fours, and we'd much prefer to be four or five rather than three. So are we actually keeping an eye on what's what's happening there? We expect you really do anticipate a change. Yeah, I mean, I think in terms of the ones around management leadership, you'll find that when you look further into the detail, most of it's about being a change. So maybe when a manager has left or there's been a change around in that management team, that then actually somebody else coming in is taking a different approach and maybe looking at things differently and, and maybe sort of like some of the things that we thought might have been working well are not working as well as they should be. So that's where the remedial action's gone in and we've actually looked to sort of really improve things from there. Um, but can I just ask, I mean, the assessment is made at the point of change, if you see what I mean. Uh, <laughs> I know it's chicken and egg, but... but What's happening there? Okay, it's not. As, it's obviously not as simple as that. Sometimes, so you know, sometimes it is about being aware of what's going on and how we then we support that change, if that makes sense. Which obviously I means it wouldn't be appropriate to go into the detail of that. I, I wonder as well, Councillor Maitland, just to um, hopefully give assurance. Sometimes these um, unannounced suspensions come up with the areas that we were aware or we, we, we believe to be happening, but gathering the evidence sometimes is challenging when you have managers that um, may wish to divert you from what you're trying to um, challenge. And then when the care inspectorate go in and actually um, dig deeper than we sometimes can, just given uh, that there that, that is the unannounced element, then um, that information further gives you the information that you can then take forward and challenge some of the management functions and roles. And we have had some challenges with some of our leaders and some of our services which have um, resulted in change. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I think there's clearly um, known unknowns and unknown unknowns, as I would say. So it's very hard to know when you don't know what you don't know. So, um, but I think yeah. So I think the good thing about this is we're actually seeing an annual report, so it allows us to see at a glance maybe yeah there does seem to be something there about management being uh, at three or a four or whatever. Whereas we normally we'll see this when we get two inspection reports at a time, for example. So you don't get the annual picture if you like. So it is. I think there's a use, and it's not just because we want to get grilled by the the media or otherwise um, about about uh, inspection reports because we have, as I say, seen all these already. So it's not sort of news in that sense, but. Uh, are there any other questions? Councillor Carruthers, Ian. Thank you. Just a quick one on the back. Of, it is absolutely in the back of, of, the, of the questions that have been asked. And it kind of takes me back to the, the question that Councillor Little brought up earlier. 
So if it's the transitional leadership management, change of personnel is what it sounds like is, is the particular issue. And if they've been almost uh, guarding what's potentially really happening, if, if that's a scenario that's been that's been taking place. So it, it makes me think uh, there's potentially vulnerable people there and they're right. So if they were looking to make a complaint, I just wonder what the risk was to them. So if they wanted to make a complaint, but if, if other information is maybe being guarded or possibly even withheld or constrained, then that, that the, the ability for somebody to be able to complain to the person about the person who's looking after them and so on and so forth. I see a risk there uh, for the person themselves. I just wondered, is that, has that been picked up on at all? Has there been any, any of these points? Has any of this, what we're looking at today, led to, have we uncovered any of that? Um, I think, reflecting back in terms of what the care inspector said, um, it is about making sure we've got systems in whereby people who are cared for are able to make complaints. So the fact that, that for most people, certainly in children's services, there'll be a social worker. In adult care, for those people who are using these services, there's usually a social worker or a link into that social work team, if need be. And for quite a number of these people, they will have an individual advocate who will act on their behalf. And, and that is about the recognition of their vulnerability. But equally then, when, when they're being cared for within a, a service, you want to be absolutely sure that you've got a means for that person to be able to tell you how things are. Um, and therefore, if they do make a complaint of some sort, you're able then to act on that pretty quickly. Uh, Councillor Murray, then Councillor Wood. Yeah, I, th I think what I find a bit concerning about this report is that over a period of three inspections, the majority are in 2016, but some are 2014, some 2017, no services actually improved. And a number of services have deteriorated. And I think, you know, what is an underlying reason for that rather than about specific service is that around inability to recruit the appropriately qualified staff because we know we've got a problem with recruitment of, of qualified staff across the region or is it a budgetary issue is there is there actually an underlying issue here which is resulting in a deterioration of the quality of services over a period of three inspections I think in terms of an over underlying issue, I think probably the one that would jump out really is just about the increase in demand on services, you know, and the really difficult environment that, that um, our staff are working in. Um, and that, that also relates to the complexity of some of the issues they're dealing with. You know, so that's the bit I think that is putting pressure more and more on people. I think um, it is difficult to recruit at times, but I think overall we've managed to maintain the recruitment of these services, bar and possibly the the, the Dunmuir Park um, respite one about part of the crisis about making sure we had enough staff in. So that one clearly was about a, a staffing crisis, really. But I, I do think if you would want to look at it across the board and, and overall, I think it is about the sort of the environment people that are, are working in and, and their, the demands that are coming up and the level of complexity that, that that poses for our staff. It's a really hard job out there for people. Um, and I think that's reflected through some of these services, really. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Wood. It was really to follow on from what uh, Councillor Maitland was saying with regards to the drop in management and leadership. Now, your response was that it's change. I take it that's staffing change. And if it's staffing change, have we got a large turnover? And if we've got a large turnover, what is the problem? Why are we getting this large turnover within your staff? I don't think we have a, a large turnover as such. I think what we've got are a small number of services here um, with specific issues that have arisen in relation particularly to some of the sort of management and leadership within those services. And I think as Lillian said, some of that we knew about and we needed to be able to, to demonstrate that the evidence around what was happening in order to take action. And that is where the inspections are really quite positive for us from that perspective. I take it you have a system of succession planning? We certainly are looking at succession planning in terms of looking at who's coming up through the service, um, not just for these services, but in, in general really, about making sure that we're giving people opportunities then to step up and maybe sort of experience what some of the, the issues were about. I'm thinking of the learned disability services in particular, where we've looked at sort of around who's moving up within, say, our ARCs, who might want to move into management rather than stay within practice. We would do that within our, our residentials as well, as we would do across the whole service. So yes, we do do that. Um, it's more successful in some bits than, than it is in others, um, but it's a really important issue. Councillor McClelland. Yeah, just coming back in again on this review and monitoring um, 
Lillian, you, you mentioned there uh, earlier on about um, how some of the management team in the past may have been able to hide information or, uh, not you, uh, or we've been unable to fully exploit the, the failings that the care inspector are picking up. So on that same then, what, um, what are we actually doing to um, change the way we review, audit and inspect and how often are we actually doing that ourselves other than uh, the incumbent doing it on a monthly basis? So what are we actually doing to dig in there? Because we know the criterion that the care inspector are using with uh, that they shared some of that earlier. So why aren't we taking that same criterion and looking for the evidence to be provided to us rather than waiting until the care inspectorate do it on an annual basis? I'm happy to, to respond to that. Um, one of the challenges we've got is a capacity issue. We have a quality improvement team of two to cover the full of social work services. Um, and I certainly don't wish to say that this is around resources, but that is an area that over the years, um, as budget has um, reduced, then that's an area that we've had to um, look at just because we cannot take away from the frontline operational delivery. So, you know, I, I absolutely accept that that um, could be, be viewed as a negative, um, and quite rightly so, but some of it is around how do we, as a management team, which is a very small management team within social work services, how do we have an overview? We do do unannounced inspections, we do case audits, and um, we have our own locality managers and senior managers who audit their own team and provide assurance and, and information back up uh, to the strategic team, which is effectively myself, Heather, and Stephen Morgan as the senior manager for children and families. So um, whilst it's not ideal within the parameters in which we work and within the resource that we currently have, um, then that's what we try to do to oversee this. The issue that I was really trying to share with members is that even with all the scrutiny in the world, if managers um, choose not to share that information with you, um, and one of the, the, the um, services recognised within this report, and I think I shared this when it first came to committee, one of the managers is no longer with the local authority, which might give an indication as to some of the um, behaviour that was going within that management role. So it's difficult for me to um, say to you that we can always know what's going on in every single service. We have many services under the social work umbrella. We try to monitor those and manage those as effectively as we can. But there's absolutely a capacity issue that you cannot be in every service all of the time. And the use of the external scrutiny actually helps us to do some of our planning and monitoring. And there is a situation where you may be dealing with crisis in one service and you take the eye off the ball with the other. And that, um, unfortunately, is the nature of our business. And we try wherever we can with partners to, to, to monitor and manage every service effectively as we can. Thank you. Um, if I can't see any other further questions for this particular report, so are we happy to, or at least content to note the report as is? Noted. Thank you. Um, that takes us on to item seven, which is the um, feedback from the Social Work Services Annual Conference, and I think Lillian's uh, happy to provide a little bit of information on that. Thank you, members. Um, at previous Social Work Committee, it was agreed that I would bring some feedback uh, from the, the conference that took place in June 2019 um, with a focus on the relationships, rights and recognitions of the service within the wider professional delivery. Um, it would be fair to say that the conference this year um, was more challenging in terms of attendance and um, clearly financially then we'd been unable to have elected members with us, which I think you know, um, was difficult for us because I think it's important for members to to hear some of the stuff and some of the development and challenges that face the service. However, I would also say that we had uh, two workshops. We were presenting at two workshops and some of the developments that we've taken forward for some of our services and the feedback we received with regards to those was extremely positive and it raised the profile for Dumfries and Galloway and showed the wider national colleagues some of the stuff that we are trying to do in these very uh, challenging and difficult times. So I think that was positive and, and you know, uh, credit to the staff that gave up their time to go and do that. 
I think the most important point for me would be to say to members that Social Work Scotland recognise as a professional and leadership body that they need to be able to make the access to the information sharing element of the con conference wider available. And I certainly know that members that have attended in the past have found hearing some of the, the challenges that we face uh, to be beneficial. So there is a review currently undergoing that rather than having one conference over two days at a national um, arena, i.e. normally Creef Hydro, they're looking to do a series of roadshows um, that would bring elements of the conference that obviously can't replicate the conference, that would bring elements of the conference to each of the regions, um, southwest of Scotland, and you know that for me would open up the opportunity certainly for members of this committee to attend and hopefully for more staff to be able to attend to learn, share experiences um, and understand some of the challenges that we're facing. So that works currently in consultation. Clearly from our professional point of view, Social Work Scotland, um, we're negotiating with the government to ask for some support to be able to share some of the, the, the learning that we have done through the conference process. And, and to bring that out to a wider audience. So I'm hopeful that that will be the way forward as we move, because there's a recognition, particularly around the, the reduction in attendance, both from staff, from elected members, and from third sector partners, and their ability to, to attend something that takes two days out of your diary, and quite frankly, is quite costly. So as Chief Social Work Officers, we've been lobbying for a different way in which to run this professional interaction with those um, members and colleagues that are, are important to our agenda. I'm happy to take any questions. Any questions from members on that? Uh, Councillor Wood. Uh, yeah, when I was reading the, the objectives, I was concerned about when you're talking in terms of recruitment and it's about maxim <laughs> maximising local, regional, national and international market penetration and awareness. Do you consider the negative effect this could have on some of the third world countries that you're taking these people from? I, I think we're all fully aware and um, the, the element I would say, Councillor Wood, is that you have to have a particular level of qualification to become a social worker in Scotland. And it is focusing on the social work, the profession, rather than social care. So I, 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 I appreciate that there are differences, but um, in terms of being a qualified social worker, you have to meet a particular criteria, and not every country, unfortunately, has social workers trained to the same standard. Ms. Maitland. Just with the relation to the way that um, Lillian's thinking about things going forward, um, would, would we be looking at mini conferences all round, or would we be looking to split, um, let's say, health and social care? You know, being taken to one part of the country as opposed to, and children's services to another, or how do you envisage this actually being ha happening? And, and would it be very relevant to each area? Um, you know, pick a weakness or pick a strength or pick an interest. I don't know how this would be done. Uh, certainly the proposal at the moment is looking at regional events that would cover, so whatever aspects of the, con so for example, at this conference in particular, there was um, focus on recruitment and retention of social workers, about the, the, the professional development of social workers. There was stuff around the role of the care inspector. There was stuff around Community Justice Scotland, which affects every um, local authority and every local authority area. So the proposal would be to have regional events that cover all the same areas that would have been covered at the conference. How quite that will happen is currently in consultation. Thank you, members. Uh, with that, then, are we happy to um, note the feedback? Okay, thank you. And item eight, then, is the Workforce Sustainability Programme Board report. Um, and this is uh, to let us know about partnership arrangements in respect of workforce sustainability. Um, we're being asked to um, note the establishment of the Programme Board as detailed and then discuss priorities identified. So. Um, Heather, are you going to be speaking to this in the first instance uh, and then be able to take any questions from members? Yeah, I'm happy to take questions. I think the key bit of it is about sort of a uh, note and fan committee that this board has been established really um, and its importance from a partnership perspective in terms of the, then looking at, at health and social care partnership right across the board around recruitment issues rather than sort of us doing that as individual um, employers. 
But yes, I'm happy to take any questions. Just on a point of clarity before we open it up, uh, on 3.8, presumably, I, th I suppose the intention is that elected members would be welcome to, to attend the event there. We're not explicit. We'd like to be invited, I think, whether or not we attend is a different matter, but um, uh, could, can we make sure that, that we're, that's available to us? Uh, yes, we've had that discussion this morning with July, and yes, we're absolutely confirmed that elected members can be invited and will be invited, so those arrangements will be put in hand. Uh, members, any questions? Councillor Murray. It's really more of a comment, but um, Julie made uh, reference in an earlier report about the meetings between the leader and uh, deputy leader of the council and the health board and the IGB. And certainly, one of the topics we've had in discussion in those meetings is the shared problem we have with recruitment and retention, and whether in, uh, by the council and the health board, more across the piece, working together, there are ways in which we can help to solve each other's problems and or indeed you know we've got quite a number of people in redeployment as a result of budget decisions there may be opportunities there to work with the health service and so on in, in terms of uh, assisting each other Just, i mean I'm, I'm looking at recommendation 2.2 obviously is that something that you feel should be sort of included because uh, we're being asked to discuss the priorities um i suppose with a view to including that as a subject for discussion or, or consideration at the event so is that something we can maybe capture um, today while we're while we're doing this? Yeah. Okay. Okay. And then just in response to Councillor Murray, I think um, the issues that Councillor Murray raises are really important, and I think those are the very key issues. It is the bit about actually where is there the mutual benefit um, for both of us as employers at the minute. Um, although we're trying to get the third sector around the table as well, I think we're really clear that actually what we need to look at is is NHS and the council and then bring in the third sector as well, but look very much at where we're sharing issues, where we're sharing uh, potential problems, about how we might approach that together, and when we're maybe going out to do a recruitment drive or whatever, that we do that jointly, where maybe we're looking at, at making sure that um, we think sort of DG-wide, as opposed to just our own, um, and whether it's us the council or whether it's the NHS, so that what we're saying is actually thinking about how you would maybe be trying to attract maybe somebody into a GP post, but you'd maybe also be looking and saying, well, if that person had a spouse, you know, where might they go to work? Um, could we then look across, um, they may be a teacher, they may be a social worker, that we begin to join things up to make sure that we make it as easy as possible for people to see what we've got available. They obviously would have to go through the same processes as anybody else, but we at least make those joins for people. Um, and, and that's very much sort of part of, of where this is, is heading around the board, looking at some of those issues, about how we can begin to do some of that, really, um, in a more joined-up way that actually is, is beneficial to us all. Uh, Councillor Maitland? Um, I suppose, yes, if I've got a comment on this, um, and looking at the core membership of the programme board, um, it, it does seem to be sort of very nhs -y. Um, and, you know, we've got to be realistic about this. You know, the NHS contributes five-sixths of the budget, and we contribute one-sixth. And, you know, we've got to, got to be aware of that. That's, that's the way that the whole thing has been structured, because we've got the acute services in, which I think is absolutely right, and I don't think anybody doesn't think that's the case. But um, it, 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 it translates over to looking at that core membership with the you know, chief executive. And I had to think, well... Which chief executive? Who's the chief executive? I mean, obviously, it's NHS, is when one works through. It is the, the NHS chief exec. Um, but, but just looking at that, the way it's, it's structured there, and you only have to have five members, well, you wouldn't have to have anybody who wasn't NHS um, um, to be for it. Um, and, and I suppose I'm thinking about the social media programs that are being done at the moment, which um, I think are, are brilliant, absolutely great. Um, but they are being fronted up, again, by NHS, and looking at it, I didn't get the sense exactly what Heather is talking about, um, that there was, um, it was absolutely clear that these would be DG-wide public service, um, um, and, and indeed, third, third sector, you know, it, it just seemed to be more focused at the NH side of things. And don't get me wrong, NHS is quite clear. They have said absolutely clearly that um, the workforce sustainability is their top panic. You know, there's nothing more panic making than the, than the workforce um, or lack of to keep providing services here. So I do recognize all this, but, but just generally in terms of tweaking it, 
could we be absolutely sure that we really do make certain that we are actually using public money in its widest possible opportunity? Um, because it does just seem to me at the moment that it's, it's more NHS-based. And if I was looking at it, I think as an NHS um, or somebody going for maybe a more medical-based um, career, that's what I would think it was aimed at. And maybe might not think it was actually aimed at me if I wasn't directly NHS. So that's just basically what it, it came to as, as me. I think you've coined a new uh, term there, which is NHSE, which uh, I think we can all identify with. Um, but uh, I, I mean, I'm taking that two point one is effectively this has been established, and it's not really there to be tweaked. But there is a, a, a sort of rule that obviously we would like to have a presence at all, at all those meetings, um, not just to make up quorum or whatever it might be. But if you want to address that, uh, yes, I will. I think I think we have to recognise that actually, you know, that the bulk of the staff in the partnership are NHS. And therefore, there has to be some extent some priority given around that. Absolutely clear on that one. And therefore, we've, we've, I suppose we've gone from an NHS based meeting to, to pull that into a partnership meeting. So, and that meeting has met on a partnership basis now twice. So, we're still at the very early days. We're really clear about the, the, the who's there. So, I mean, I'm there, um, or Lillian's there, one of the other of us is there plus somebody from um, HR, so James McDowell would be there as well. Um, we've given a commitment to be there so that we can continue to have those conversations and challenge, which we do do, around actually how do we make sure that, um, and it's, it is about how do we make sure within what we know is an absolute priority for the NHS, but how do we make sure that we don't lose sight then of the other more partnership-based issues? And we look at those opportunities. Now, that isn't necessarily going to be easy um, in terms of making that shift. So one of the discussions we had at the last board was about branding. And we were being really clear about that needs to be partnership branding around some of this, which you know addresses some of those issues that you have mentioned around social media. Um, now, that will take us a while to get there. You know, because again, simply because there are a set of priorities that absolutely need to be pushed forward from the NHS's perspective around some of the, the harder, you know, the harder to fill vacancies, which at this point in time, we don't have those. We're in a fortunate position of not having harder to fill, um, that we're managing to sort of bring people in. So we want to be as supportive as we possibly can be to our NHS colleagues, but equally wanting to be able to say very clearly, how can we look at this in a, slightly different way so that we do get that much wider perspective and that's what we're really aiming for and I think from my perspective and James's perspective that's supposed to the approach we take in that meeting about how we make sure we keep a, a wider view on it. But that's very reassuring. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Uh, Councillor McKee. Uh, what, what you said about a membership of that committee, it was said earlier on, I can assure you, um, we went through a process of grow your own for social workers. Is there any chance that a, a joint grow your own could be done with the health service? Maybe just a, a, a year's education or two years, and then they separate into what they, where they want to specifically go. But I think, I think we need to look at, can we recruit our own and train our own? And we know that they're at the standard that we want rather than just uh, hoping for a, a recruitment now and again. I can't speak on behalf of some of the NHS posts, but we, we clearly continue to grow our own in terms of social workers, and we do so for our mental health officers as well. That's something that we're really positive about, and we're really keen that whatever else we have to do, we can't lose that, because that is, that's about our future. You know, that is about making sure that we've got staff in place. We haven't looked at this point in terms of whether we could bring people in. That might relate more to when we get to the position of saying, are there, are there new roles that we need to develop? And therefore that you might look at it at a basket of skills for people whereby it might be well appropriate to be able to, to bring it at a more general level to then look at, at specialising as you go. So, but that's certainly something that, you know, we can take back to that board to sort of say, how could we maybe sort of think about taking some of that forward? Uh, I've got no further questions. Oh, sorry, Councillor McClelland. Yeah, no one's mentioned the red box on the risk register, so I thought I'd better mention it. Um, obviously, it's relating to Brexit. Uh, do, do we have any indications whatsoever as to the number of potential uh, staff we may lose and how difficult it will be 
with a salary cap of 36k, um, what impact that might have on attracting uh, EU27 or immigrants into these positions? Do we have any view on that? We certainly have. There's certainly a piece of work that's ongoing at the minute um, that is chaired by the NHS chief executive around um, preparation and that that considers amongst a number of other things about what the impact will be on staff and I can't give you the details of what that would be at this point in time but I am involved in that piece of work so I am aware of something that you know is very active and is ongoing and then it obviously links back across with um, the council in terms of what else might go on and Julie is obviously here to tell you more than I can. <laughs> um, I as, as Heather has just said, um, Jeff Ace is, is currently um, has established a sort of um, EU exit um, group um, within health where we are looking at the, the numbers of staff. Clearly, we have a number of particularly medical staff um, who have come from the EU. Um, and certainly prior to March, um, we had engaged with... Um, our staff and asked them about their intentions or if they required any support from us as a board. Um, so the numbers, in terms of the overall population, I can't give you the exact number just now, Councillor McClellan, but we can certainly come back with that. The numbers aren't huge, but they are very significant in terms of the roles that these individuals undertake. So it's not necessarily about us saying, oh, we've got hundreds of people that we will lose, but if we lose two or three people, it could have a significant impact on our ability to deliver services. So some of the specialties, and particularly the medical specialties that these individuals work within, if we were to lose individuals, that would have a significant impact on our ability to continue to deliver services. So we have, um, just this morning, the Chief Executive re-established that EU exit committee um, within the board so we will be sort of now redoubling our efforts to engage with these individuals so that we can prepare understanding what their intentions will be. What we also um, need to be take cognizance of is the impact that this will have, not just in terms of the the likelihood that we may we could lose some staff, but our ability to recruit. So when we've looked at when we've had challenges in the past. Um, colleagues will remember the dental crisis, I'm sure, way back in about 2007, 2008 in Dumfries and Galloway, when we were unable to provide NHS dental services. The way in which we recruited our way out of that problem was by recruiting lots of dentists from the EU. Um, and, 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 you know, the challenge for us locally will be about the sustainability of those services moving forward if we're unable to recruit. So, um, We've got, obviously, we've got a, a key group working at the moment, looking at that, understanding, not, as I say, specifically numbers per se, but actually looking in detail at what areas might be significant challenge and what our contingency plans need to be for that. So, as I say, the group was re-established just this morning and it will continue to meet on a weekly basis. And I'm more than happy to keep the, the committee up to date at future meetings about, about how that's progressing. I think, I, could I just make a comment here about Councillor Maitland's comment about the, the group? Um, I, I think, I think it was a, it's a really helpful, um, comment around the Workforce Sustainability Programme Board. As Heather said, this group, it was set up initially looking at NHS recruitment and Certainly, it's my role as the Chief Officer for Health and Social Care. I was very clear that whilst the recruitment challenges within the NHS, we absolutely have to do everything we can to fix them. If we fix all of those challenges, but we don't fix the challenges we've got elsewhere in the partnership, we're still not going to be able to deliver a sustainable health and social care model. So the, the group is just it's moving towards having much more of a partnership focus. And I think certainly, um, you know, Heather and James's involvement in that, that group is very helpful. Um, but, you know, we absolutely, we are, we are absolutely promoting the need for us to address recruitment challenges we have everywhere. And I don't need to tell colleagues around this table, it goes everything from providing home care through to providing consultants at every level. So, and we need to look at those. One of the things we're, we are looking at, we talked, um, Councillor McKee asked about Grow Your Own. Um, a number of, we are looking at how we work with schools and young people around um, providing them with knowledge and information about the plethora of um, careers that are available within health and social care. 
because quite often when we talk to the, the young people in the community, they think the NHS in particular is doctors and nurses. Well, what we know is there are over sort of 200 careers you can have in the NHS and a whole range of um, different disciplines, clinical and non-clinical disciplines. So we've held a number of recruitment fairs and recruitment events targeted at young people in schools. And one of the things I'm really keen for us to develop through that Workforce Sustainability Programme Board is a career pathway for young people. So it's about us saying, if young people are interested in working in health and social care, but they don't know exactly whether they want to be an occupational therapist or a physiotherapist or a social worker or a nurse, how do we develop career pathways for them into health and social care and then support them in their training? Because what we do know is that the workforce challenges are, as the Chair said, the single biggest challenge for us, I think, in terms of financial challenges are absolutely out there, they're there, but the sustainability of the workforce is the key challenge for us. So it is about how do we think about getting young people into health and social care and then supporting their development, because no matter what career they might choose to work in, we know that we're going to experience challenges in recruiting into those careers further down the line looking at our demographic population. So we really need to be as proactive as we can be about that whole grow your own from our local community encouraging young people into health and social care and that will be part of that workforce sustainability program board's work and certainly feeding back up to the integration leadership group which the leader and deputy leader sit on with the chair and vice chair of the health board. Sorry that was a long ramble but I, was, I had a number of points I wanted to make as the, as the questions were Glad you stayed, Julie. And uh, obviously, that's some of these things. Uh, hopefully, will be sort of picked up and refreshed to some extent at the the event in October, which hopefully elected members will be able to if they want to attend. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions, Councillor Crothers? Ian, yeah, just a small because I was going to pick up on the same point, but I think it's, it was well raised in the first place. Certainly, Gail picked up on it from, from, from our perspective. But it, you go further down, so it talks about the core membership. So maybe. I thought the, 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 the governance seminar in evening September probably would have said something there as well. But when it says the programme board will communicate with the wider stakeholder group and will engage them as appropriate and specific uh, programmes of work, this group, which may be extended, amended, or programmes developed, will include, and again, it's completely NHS when you look at that for what I can see. So, I mean, so long as it's been picked up on, I think it is because it is a partnership and it explains that the purpose of the report is about the partnership and involvement, and it even goes into non-executive non members. So, from the council perspective, hopefully that will get picked up as the future goes on. I, I'll absolutely, as I say, I think these comments are extremely helpful and, and I will take them back to the this Workforce Sustainability Programme Board. I think it, it is really important that as we do that, wider engagement and it, and it is about how we attract people to work and live and stay within Dumfries and Galloway across the whole of the health health board and the local authority and our wider partners then we absolutely need to make sure that colleagues from the council elected members as well as officers of the council as well as our colleagues in the third and independent sector are appropriately engaged in this and and as I say it was We've only had, as Heather said, a couple of meetings where we're looking at broadening it out, but your your points will absolutely be taken into consideration. I think we need to look at how we broaden out the range of individuals who are contributing to that work in its, its widest sense. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Howie. Uh, thanks, Chair. It's just uh, kind of lo looking at EU workforce, trying to uh, bring them over. Are you looking at any non-financial incentives to try and recruit? Obviously, there's a lot of uncertainty about the pound, uh, which uh, may uh, detract from the attractiveness over here. Is there any non-financial uh, incentives that could be considered? I, I think that's all still... Um, we have just recruited um, a sort of recruitment sustainability manager who's got a huge amount of experience um, down south in terms of sort of international recruitment, and she's looking at what we've done today and coming up with some other suggestions. I mean, I think if there were other things that we could do, um, you know, within our, within our powers to encourage people to come, then we absolutely would. I mean, we do offer things like relocation packages and things to support people um, relocating. So we'll support them with, um, you know, rental of properties, etc. cetera, um, we, and, and even supporting people to find accommodation. And, and one of the, one of the big things that when we when we built the new hospital, um, colleagues will remember we've built some residencies attached to the new hospital as well. Those aren't just for doctors. Um, those are for 
people who come to work who, who need accommodation. It's mostly doctors who use them because mostly doctors come for part of their training and they're here for a short period of time. But anything that we can do, we will, we will look at. And I think it is, um, we've, accommodation seems to be a key one, um, for individuals. And again, that's something that colleagues in the council and in the, our partner agencies could potentially help us with in terms of us, us looking to provide some of those non-financial incentives, but it's ongoing work at the moment. Thank you very much. Um, I have no further questions on this item, so are we happy, to, given all the points that have been raised today, if they can be captured as part of the discussion under uh, Recommendation 2.2 um, and obviously fed back into the to the board, um, and then we'll look forward to whatever invitation comes to us in terms of being able to attend or participate. Um, but with that, uh, are we happy on that basis to note and um, 2.1 and 2.2? .2? Okay, thank you. Uh, final item on the agenda is the um, minute of the meeting of the Public Protection Committee uh, on 30th of April. Are we happy to note that? Uh, Councillor Wood? What I'd like to do is to raise the 4.2 where we're talking about adult C. I don't want to get into the nitty gritty of what actually happened, but I do note there's eight bullet points arise from it. How do we as a committee um, get the reassurance that those eight bullet points will be addressed? And will it be evidence to us that it has been or they have been? Pass it over to the Chief Social Work Officer to give you an answer. Sorry? Oh, thank you. Right, yeah. Uh, thanks, Councillor Wood. Um, yeah, part of the SCR process, again, is that we are required um, through this process to submit um, an action plan to the Care Inspectorate um, and also to the adult, sorry, to the, the Public Protection Committee. So the responsibility sits with the Public Protection Committee and the independent chair to oversee the actions and to ensure that we, as a partnership, meet those actions and, and improve, um, as indicated through the uh, the findings of the independent reviewer. Um, this also is required to be reported back to the Chief Officers Group, who have the governance responsibility for the delivery of any findings from any significant case review. Yes, and there's one other point on page 47 on the eighth paragraph down. When did public protection start to deploy scare tactics? If you read at the bottom, it says, in the current economic climate, effective performance information is an important tool to inform members on the best areas to utilise scare resource to the best effect. I'll take that back to the, um, the minute taker and we'll have that changed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, with that, then, um, thank you very much for your uh, participation today, members. That's the end of the meeting. Thank you.